Um, so good afternoon uh, and thank you for, for joining us and welcome back to our wing we uh, Wednesday webinar series. Um, if you um, haven't met me before, um, uh, Dr. Elisa Fuentes Montemayor, I'm a senior lecturer in biotechnology uh, at the University of Sydney. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of echo. Uh, I don't know if it's just my end. Um, if people could mute their, their microphones for a bit, please. Um, that would be great. And right, so just before we start, uh, I just want to remind you that um, our webinars are free to ensure that everyone um, can join and that you can uh, catch up with previous webinars that you may have missed on our YouTube channel. And um, if you are in a position to donate, uh, we'd very much appreciate you considering to do so. Uh, we will be putting the link up uh, uh, in the chat uh, to our donations page uh, so you can uh, access that um, and donate if you can, please. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, um, just to let you know, we have um, other exciting webinars coming up. Um, and yeah, you can find more about this and other events that um, Paths Without Borders are organizing uh, if you visit our webpage. So please uh, put in these dates in your diaries and uh, so you can join us for future um, webinars and events. Right, uh, so if we move on to um, the next slide um, and just um, before we, um, I introduce our, our speaker for today, uh, just a bit of um, housekeeping, um, just to remind you for sound quality and internet stability, please um, keep your microphones on mute and your videos off. And we will be welcoming your questions. Um, and you can type them in, in, in the chat through the presentation. And then at the end, um, I can read them out uh, or you can unmute um, to ask your questions at the end uh, if you wish. And also just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded uh, so that other people um, can uh, catch up once we post it on our, uh, our YouTube channel. Right, so today I am delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Gregory Mutumi, uh, who is a multifaceted biologist who specializes in wetland habitats and endangered plants and animals. He has expertise in zoology, forestry, and biological sciences. And his work includes assisting in the reduction of the effects of construction activities on sensitive natural resources. Today, Dr. Mutumi is going to give us an account of how amazing his journey with bats has been and how it all began. He'll begin by giving us um, an account of his field trips in seven countries in Southern Africa. Uh, and then he will tell us why he enjoys such studies and how he plans to further um, his career in this respect. Um, and just to, uh, just to say, um, we particularly appreciate um, um, Dr. Mutumi joining us today because he's um, somewhere exciting uh, in the field. So he's having a bit of um, uh, trouble with um, connection um, stability. So for that reason, he has joined us um, on his phone. So there won't be any slides to, to accompany his talk, uh, but he's still going to talk us through um, um, his story uh, today. So thank you very much, Greg, and I'm over to you. Looking forward to listening to your story. Greg, if you're still there. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Um, I hope my sound is clear over that side. Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Okay, that's good. So, well, yes, I'm excited to be talking today. I've got lots of stories. Um, the time won't be enough, but um, please uh, get in touch with me through my LinkedIn profile and also through ResearchGate, if you would like to learn more about the work that I've done with BEST and the work that I plan to do with BEST. 
So where did it all start? Oh, um, the story is long. Um, I'm from Zimbabwe or, originally. Uh, Zimbabwe is a landlocked country in the northern part of South Africa. So our neighbors are South Africa, Mozambique in the east, and Botswana, uh, Namibia in the west, in the north, there is Zambia. I started working as a forester and I completed my first degree in forestry in Zimbabwe. And um, even though I studied plants, I was always curious about animals, especially small mammals. And um, we would encounter a lot of these uh, small mammals in the forest where I started working, especially bats. And um, most people didn't really like to encounter bats, but I was just curious about what bats were really doing uh, there in the wild. So I went on with my studies and I completed my first degree and then I found a uh, place for postgraduate studies at the University of Cape Town. Um, I, I started working with water birds and when we were trapping water birds, in our nets, there would be always a lot of bats, especially when we put up nets at, uh, close to sunset. So I would always be taking a lot more bats from the nets than than, than birds. There, there's a lot of bats in, in Zimbabwe and in Southern Africa in general. Um, quite a huge diversity from the fruit bats, the big ones, all the way to the horseshoe bats, the, the smaller ones. So, well, when I completed my master's, I then met, I came across Professor David Jacobs, who um, studies bats, uh, who used to study bats at University of Cape Town, is now retired. And he took me up into his lab, and he wanted to do a lot of fieldwork in, in Southern Africa, which I was also very interested in. And he had just got some funding from the National Research Foundation in South Africa. So I embarked on the exciting journey of looking for bats. And um, that's how it all began. We went into seven different countries. We started in South Africa. There they are amazing batting places in South Africa. Um, all the way from Cape Town, there are caves close to um, 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 the coast, and there are caves inland, and there are caves on the northern border close to Zimbabwe. We went into all these caves, um, etching and sampling the beds. We would capture and release, take measurements, take samples for genetic studies. We also had equipment for echolocation coal studies. We would record the coals and then analyze the coals. So during that time, we managed to sample several sites in uh, South Africa. But then my um, collaborators wanted to also further their studies into several parts of um, Southern Africa. And I was willing to lead the team. So I was excited about the opportunity. I made arrangements with uh, different countries. I contacted the Parks and Wildlife of uh, Mozambique, of Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, Malawi, and Namibia. And uh, we started going into all those countries. We would find uh, bats in unused mines. We would find bats in Rock crevices, that was amazing. In Matopos, for example, in Zimbabwe, it's a, it, 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 it's a national park uh, in the southern part of Zimbabwe. It has got a lot of rocks and crevices. I, I didn't expect to find bats in there. There aren't real caves there, but at night when we put up our mist nets, there were a lot of bats coming onto the net, and I was just curious where all these bats were coming from. So in the morning, we took a walk and started looking in, into those crevices. Like um, there were a lot of bits hiding in those crevices. Then another interesting thing is that um, also in 
in those countries, there were like um, baobab trees that have cavities. So we went into those um, huge cavities in the baobab trees, and we would find a lot of birds uh, hanging on the roof of the of the cavity. And um, old mines, and then real caves, different types of caves. Some of the caves are like dungeons; they go they go down, and others are like going into the mountain. We found a lot of birds in there. And um, we managed to sample almost about 10 different species of um, rhinolophid bats. These are called the horseshoe bats. Then we also had a lot of fruit bats. We also had um, a very interesting bat called the Hipposidra itatas. I think it's, it is the largest known uh, insect eating bat in Southern Africa. We sampled all these, and for my thesis, I focused on two species uh, called, one of them is called Rhinolophus uh, swinii, and the other one is called Rhinolophus simulator. Um, my focus was to look at um, the variation in phenotypes across different geographic locations. And I wanted to explain and find answers that would explain the differences in the phenotype, especially in the echolocation core signals across different habitats. So we wrote, um, I wrote my thesis based on that. And from that thesis, I managed to publish three papers that looked at geographic variation um, that, that were themed on geographic variation in the phenotypes. And in those papers, the main finding, uh, you can find those papers on my research gate profile. Um, um, if you've got questions, you can also email me. So uh, in those papers, the main findings were that um, in different geographic locations, different populations of these bats, Rhinolophus simulator and Trinii, are encountering different levels or different um, degrees of clutter. So they have specialized flight patterns in different habitats of different degrees of clutter. And these, these specialized flight patterns that they have also tie in with their echolocation core signal. So different populations were seen to have different echolocation core signals because of how they were foraging within the different habitats. So in habitats of high degree of clutter, you would find that there are Echolocation core signal was was um, higher, and high echolocation core signals have got a higher resolution of closely cluttered habitats. But at the same time, high core signals are attenuated faster, so it can only see within a short range. But that was good enough short range in high clutter because they need to resolve things that are cluttered in clo within close range. And then as we looked at other habitats that had uh, less clutter, we would find that the echolocation core frequency was significantly higher. Um, it increased with, 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 with less clutter. So they were using um, low frequency core signals in less cluttered environments. Low frequency signal uh, travels a longer distance, but doesn't have high resolution for closely packed uh, objects. It can resolve things that are separated more up, that are more separated apart. So that was happening. We also found out that um, it was also echolocation core signal was also varying um, because of the different humidity levels and the different temperatures at different habitats. We found that um, in places where the temperatures were high and um, humidity was low, bats were using echolocation core signal that was lower in frequency from other populations. And um, 
when we took these findings and compared uh, these findings to uh, the paper that was written by Luau uh, sometime, I think, in 20, 20, 2013, um, we were we were we we did what they call a predictive analysis, and we found out that with an increase in temperature of about two degrees in the event of climate change, these beds would actually lose the relevance I mean of their core signal in terms of detecting um, prey. So an increase in two degrees would compromise the um, foraging efficiency of these beds, which also implies that climate change will really affect these beds, and they are really sensitive, very sensitive more than we had appreciated before, because they are using this intricate, sophisticated system of navigating and capturing prey using echolocation call frequencies, which are very sensitive to climatic conditions. So in the process of uh, writing up my PhD, I also attended conferences and presented these findings. And um, I met a lot of people that were really interested in the methods that I was using. Uh, one of the methods that I am really proud of that I implemented in the thesis was called the Landis model. So the Landis model, I used it to, in one of the papers, I used it to calculate the relative contribution of drift and adaptation as a means of trying to find out how sensitive these beds were to their habitats. Um, the usual case is that when you use this model, um, the dominance or the effect of drift or genetics on the diversification of populations is, is higher than what we found in there. So it led to more support that beds are way more sensitive to habitat and climatic uh, conditions than many other species, and that adaptation and selection weighed more heavily on the on the differences in the phenotypes of populations that we are finding across uh, habitats in southern Africa. So this was a very exciting finding and I presented it at one of the conferences and um, during that conference that's when I met another professor from the United States who was interested to work with me on a, on a postdoc. Can I just hold on for a few seconds? I'll be back. Let's just give it uh, one minute for Greg to come back to us. I think he had to pause for a minute there, but hopefully he'll be back shortly. All right, I'm back. So I was talking about um, the relative contributions of drift and adaptation. It was a very interesting finding because it led me onto another very interesting trajectory with the research on that that I'm still very excited about, and I I wish to continue working in that area. So 
what I did during that time, when I found out that uh, drift was um, adaptation or selection was weighing more heavily on the diversification of these populations, I measured out the parameters of uh, the head of them. So what I did is I um, um, asked for loan some specimen from various museums in Southern Africa, as well as outside Southern Africa. I think I can remember that we got some specimen from American Museum of um, Natural History. Some of them came from the Rome Museum or something. Um, and then I um, sent, I did uh, 3D, what they call 3D microtomography, um, uh, computer tomography scanning, uh, micro CT scanning on these heads. So I had 3D images of heads of um, different populations of Rhinolophus simulator and Sweeney that had been collected from as long back as early 19, uh, I think the oldest one was 1950 something. I did, um, I then had to like, uh, carry out an analysis um, which is based on 3D images, placing landmarks and stuff on different regions of the head. And I also tried to, at this time, calculate you know, the relative contributions of drift and adaptation on what was happening on the, um, on the, on the crania of, of these beds. And I found th the same results for, for the head without any echolocation parameters and um, it was till adaptation and selection more than more than drift which implied that these bats were very tuned to their or fine tuned to their habitats and a small little shift in climatic conditions in weather conditions and um, habitat conditions would really um, affect uh, the diversification of bat populations within Southern Africa. And when I presented these findings from the crania and from the body parameters and from the echolocation core signals, I met another professor, um, Elizabeth Dumont from the University of Massachusetts that time. And she also wanted to carry out a similar analysis on the new world leaf nose bat. So I joined her lab as a postdoctoral in 2017, and uh, it was the most exciting journey that I can ever think of. Because in that lab, I managed to access about um, 50 different species of new world leaf nose bat. And um, I managed to get specimen from uh, various museums, and I had access to the latest technology scanning equipment for 3D images at, at Harvard University. And I also managed to collaborate with an amazing team of researchers uh, that, that called themselves the Dimensions of Sensory Systems. Uh, this included people like Liliana, Betsy herself, and um, Steve Rosita from various universities within and outside the United States. We worked on this huge sample size of New World Leaf Nose beds, and I, during that time, enjoyed formulating several hypotheses to try and explain what was um, driving diversity in this in this family of New World Leaf Nose Beds. And one of the questions was that, if you look at the Phyllostomidae family, which is the New World Leaf Nose Beds, they are immediate relatives, um, uh, the, the Noctilio, uh, the Noctilio uh, Noids, haven't diversified as much as uh, the New World Leaf Nose Beds. They, they is about, uh, if I remember well, about, only eight different uh, species within that out group. 
whereas the phyllostomids have radiated into about 160 different species. So to answer that question, I looked at 3D images, and this time I managed to um, demarcate different regions of the head that are responsible for sensory information as well as for mechanical information. And I was now looking at how these sensory systems in the head and mechanical systems relate to each other and whether that relationship um, has led to or can explain the diversity of species within the New World Leaf North Bed. It was a very interesting research because during that time I could also compare my results from what the other members of the team were looking at in genetics. And our results were closely tying together in our findings. And the main findings of, of this research um, were that sensory systems and mechanical systems share space in the head. And um, they have changed over time at different rates. And um, especially the time just before the evolution of the phylostomids, before they split from a common ancestor with, the, with their outgroup, there was an increase, a significant increase in the rate of evolution of sensory systems more than the mechanical system. So something did happen within the sensory systems that triggered the diversification of these new world leaf nodes that differently from what happened within the immediate outgroups. And to that effect, we have a paper that just came out, I think sometime in June, that um, explains um, these, uh, this work that I'm talking about. So sensory systems evolved much earlier and faster than mechanical systems, and this triggered a whole lot of changes that drove the phylostomid family to occupy a huge diversity of uh, dietary niches um, more than what their immediate art groups could do. And um, I am still working on a data set um, that will further try to look at the differences in the evolutionary rates of um, sensory systems versus mechanical systems and to look at how diet could have contributed to the differences in the evolution of these different structures within the head they're sharing the same space in the head they're closely packed but uh, originally people used to think that these features the head just evolves as a whole but it's interesting to note that actually within the head different structures have evolved at, at different rates there's, there's some kind of a degree of freedom in the evolution of different structures in the head generally there's this modularity, that's what they call it, between sensory and mechanical systems. And when you even look at mechanical systems alone, there is a degree of freedom, there is some modularity among mechanical systems on their own and also among sensory systems on their own. And and, and this degree of freedom changes over time. So giving some kind of a pat a pattern in the in the in the in the differences and this pattern in the differences of of freedom among structures has produced or has driven the diversity of pieces within the family of phylostomids. So yeah that's that's the paper I'm currently working on right now and hoping to get it published on time next year. But um yeah there is um Quite a lot of interesting papers that I have published too that can be found on ResearchGate. And I have put up 
a few YouTube videos that that you you could watch um, if you search by my name, and I've also like given some other talks on Radio Bio. That that uh, if anyone is interested, you can also find using my name on on Google or on YouTube. Yeah, so basically th that's how my journey has been with that. It has been exciting. And what I'm hoping to do right now is that at the moment, I, um, I while I'm working on my paper, the paper that I just talked about on phylostomids, I am I'm working as, a, as an environmental consultant in the United States. But um, I'm also thinking of um, trying to find an adjunct position where I could uh, be affiliated to any university that, that that I can find, and then continue with my research and as well train um, some students that are interested in working on bed. There's a lot that we can do these days. There's now the online repository of 3D images that have got good uh, resolution, and there's also some. Um, Softwares that are available freely that do analyze these 3D images or micro uh, CT scans and 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 and, and a lot more um, work can be done just by downloading these freely available images and analyzing using um, openware so um, open 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 source softwares. Um, and um, I, I continue to look for a faculty position. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit very difficult to find one. The market is saturated and it's also very competitive. But I'm just hoping one day I'll be able to continue my work on research on beds and have a lab full of students and continue publishing more work. Um, I, th I think that's, that's all I have for today. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, uh, for sharing your, your story with us. That's very, um, a uh, very amazing journey uh, that you've had. Um, and I'm sure people will be very grateful for you to, to share that um, with us. Uh, and lots of interesting topics that you touched on. So I'm sure there will be some questions uh, from the audience. Let me just check uh, if there's anything in the chat. Um, no questions yet, but uh, people just saying thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. So um, yeah, that's that's much appreciated. Um, just to give people some time to think of questions, uh, I was just really struck by the um, uh, what you mentioned about your earlier research uh, on on bats and, and the impact of um, weather conditions on the echolocation signals. Uh, and what you said about um, increases in temperature, um, how they would potentially compromise for aging efficiency um, of some some bat species. So yeah, I just thought if you just wonder if you had any further thoughts on that um, in terms of um, future research, perhaps that we still need to do to try and understand how climate change may impact some species in relatively subtle ways like those? I did not further my attempts at doing more research in that respect, but I think there is. If you look for papers by Luau, L-U-A-O, um, or rather there is, there is my paper that, that, that looks at, um, it's actually called sensory drive mediated by climatic gradients. So that sensory paper cites the work by Luau. So Luau's lab has done a lot more work on that. And one of their findings was that um, um, temperature, increased temperature leads to higher attenuation of echolocation call signals, which means um, the distance at which the echolocation call signal remains relevant 
is reduced. So at about an increase of two degrees, that distance can no longer reach out as far as it it would at, 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 at less than two degrees um, increase, and um, it would lead to a loss in the amount and quality of prey that the bird can actually capture. And then that would also lead to a whole lot of chain of problems in terms of the bed no longer being able to access enough prey um, uh, in terms of abundance and as well as diversity and then compromising the the immunity of the bed. Because what 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 was also um, relevant in that paper was that the energy that these bears use at flying, flapping flight, as well as producing the echolocation signal, is quite high, very high relative to their body mass, which means that they really have to be always accessing a good diversity of prey and a good abundance of prey to keep up their energy requirements. So that's why they are sensitive uh, with a slight shift that leads to a whole lot of other chain of reactions that compromises their health. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for expanding on that. And there's actually a, a related question that's just come up in the chat asking um, how large is the daily temperature difference in the bats that you are talking about? Mm, how large is the daily temperature difference? Um, yeah, I don't know, Inga, if you want to uh, ask your question out loud or expand in the chat, just to clarify. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I wasn't sure how to explain because you said um, the vets experience a temperature increase of two degrees and that would uh, decrease their detection distance and the uh, um, possibility of detecting certain type of prey. But I was wondering how, how much is the daily variation in temperature these bats experience, um, for example, throughout the night when they are foraging? Oh, is it is, oh. is the nightly temperature very constant? Oh, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. You know, when I when I quoted two degrees decrease, it's an average temperature over thirty over about thirty years. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. So, it's a, it's uh, a, interesting. Yeah, it's a calculated difference over. 30 years and um, it's, 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 it's not exactly a, a, a daily change, but it's, a, it's an average change. It's a change in the average over 30 years. Ah, I get it. Um, okay, thank you. So yes, yes you're welcome. Longer term. Um, yeah, yeah, super cool. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, that's really, really amazing. Yeah, thank you for your story. Uh, I wanted to say that as well. It was super interesting. Yo. Thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anyone else has any other questions for Greg? Either to write them on the chat or raise your hand if you want to ask them out loud. No? Um, I might have another question if I can just unmute myself again. Yeah, go for it. It's <laughs> and no one and this might, um, I might be a little, um, like a very simple, simple question, but um, you said you, because I'm only working on, I, I only know the new, um, new world uh, bats mostly. I um, So I was wondering, you said that the hypocidrate bat was the largest of the hypocidrates you caught. Um, can you tell me how large they are so I get a little bit of a, a, a feeling for them because I don't know them, I've never seen them, so I'm just very curious um, how large they are actually. 
Oh, yeah. I, I meant it was the largest among the insect eaters, but it doesn't get as large as the fruit bed. But um, I would say uh, when I'm looking at it, it looks like it is as big as, um, uh, let's say, your two palms joined together. And um, yeah, if you join your two palms together, that, that's how big it is. Of course, the wingspan, if you, if you bring out your thumbs, out, then that's about the wingspan, and I think it's about um fifty grams, fifty grams oh. heavy. It's yeah, it's quite it's quite a big bat with with <laughs> with very sharp uh canines <laughs> <laughs> and big, oh. and big round eyes. Oh, that's very impressive. Well, the bats I work with are only six grams, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, simulator and swinia are around that weight, about six, eight, ten grams. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, here You're in the welcome. UK, I'm also used to working with tiny bats. So, so yeah, really impressive indeed. <laughs> and great that you <laughs> had that opportunity to work uh, with, uh, with so many species and in so many countries uh, and exciting places. Um, so I think if, if there are no other questions, um, which I can't see in the chat, um, I think just to remind people um, of uh, Greg's um, uh, papers and uh, links to, you mentioned your own research gate and LinkedIn. Uh, so if people want to reach out to you, presumably they can they can do it that way or find out more about the research that you've talked about today. Um, also, you mentioned some YouTube uh, videos, but uh, so yeah, if people uh, are interested, uh, I'm sure you will find uh, lots more about uh, Greg's uh, exciting research. Um, and in that case, I think we'll, we'll just thank you again, Greg, uh, and wish you the best uh, for your uh, future uh, research, which I'm sure will be will continue to be very exciting. Uh, and yeah, we look forward uh, to hearing more uh, about, about your um, future career. Um, and for um, attendees today, please continue to join us um, in future webinars to hear about other people's stories and, and lots of other exciting bat related research so thanks again sure. uh, everyone for joining us and especially greg uh, given the, the difficult conditions uh, you've been uh, away on field work uh, so it's very much appreciated that you managed to jo join us today and share your story with us thank you very much for that thank you so much there's, there's lots of thank yous and um, fascinating story and um, people in the chat just um, thanking you for, for sharing that story with us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoons and hopefully see you uh, in the next webinar. All right, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.